A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim I start in the name of Allah the Beneficent and the Merciful I seek salvation from Shaitan the Accursed My dearest viewers, my brothers and sisters from all across the world Assalamu Alaikum Jamian wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh May the peace, the blessings and the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you Welcome to another episode of the Ramadan show exclusively here on Imam Hussein TV with me, your host, Dr. Shabir Tijani. Inshallah, today, like every day, we will aim to cater for your every need during this month of Ramadan. I would like to remind you again that you can send your videos to us to show us and to allow us to broadcast how you prepare for this holy month, what you do on a day to day basis, and how you adopt your lives to cater for the month of Ramadan. I would like to ask you to join us on social media using the hashtag IHTVRamadan on Twitter, joining us on Facebook, Instagram and on YouTube insha'Allah. Finally, I would just like to leave you with this hadith from Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, where he says the greatest form of worship is awaiting the 12th Imam alayhi salam. He's talking to the people of our current generation and indeed we are that generation whom has been prophesied will be the generation that the 12th Imam will come to insha'Allah and we as a, as, as a group, as a community have to prepare for his reappearance by preparing ourselves physically, mentally and spiritually. In this episode, as we continue our path towards spiritual refinement, inshallah I want to continue a series that we've been continuing for the last couple of nights and that is how to make the most out of your salah and your prayer. Over the past couple of nights we've been looking at prerequisites for prayer and also strategies that you can employ in order to optimize your prayers. We shall be continuing with the strategies and there is altogether 12 strategies so inshallah I would ask you to have patience with me and inshallah take notes as well so that you can apply these teachings to your day-to-day -day lives as well. Before proceeding, I would like to once again ask you, as it's the nights of A'mal and the nights where forgiveness is granted, the nights when supplications are accepted, please ask for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not forget us in your du'as as well. As we start up with the next strategy in our list, we think about limitations and asking for forgiveness for our shortcomings. When we pray our salah, we should always constantly be conversing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should ask Him for forgiveness for any mistakes that we've made. If our prayers were not up to the right standard, we ask Him to please forgive our shortcomings. Surely this in turn as you're conversing with your Lord will increase your attention and your focus, your concentration in every prayer. If your prayers are not up to standard, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will surely forgive you if you ask Him with the most sincere of hearts. When you return to Him, promising that in the next prayer you'll perform it better than the last. And this process in itself is not only a motivation not only a goal for you to perform better next time but it's also another way of getting you to focus and concentrate and getting you to motivate yourself for the next prayer when you analyze and accept your faults accept the parts in your prayer which are not up to standard you will then be able to focus in on your prayer and realize which parts of your prayer need more attention and inshallah as you do that your prayers will be optimized, you'll gain more out of them 
and obviously gain closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next strategy I want to tell you about is trust. It is said that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam used to writhe and tremble when it was time for prayer. He was once asked about this unusual, uncommon state. And he said, the time has come for the trust which Allah offered to the heavens, the earth and the mountains. But they refused to carry it and were afraid of it. This is a direct reference to the Holy Quran and the following verse. Verily we offered the trust to the heavens, the earth and the mountains, but they refused to bear it and were afraid thereof. But man undertook it. Verily he was unjust and ignorant. Whenever the Imams used to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their prayers, their limbs trembled. They used to shake due to the intensity of their fear. People who were watching used to say sometimes it is as if you could count their breaths. Their prayer was offered as though they would never have another chance at offering a prayer. Imam Sadiq said, My father used to say when Ali, the son of Hussein alayhi salam, used to stand for prayer, he looked like a trunk of tree, nothing of which would move unless the wind would move it. This is an excellent precedent. It is a vision of how the Ma'asumin used to carry out their prayers and how they used to conduct their action in accordance with the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I've said before, if you have in your mind that the prayer you're offering at the moment is your last prayer ever, you will always have focus, you will always have that thought in your mind that if it's not, go if it's not good enough and if you've made a mistake, that you're answerable for that mistake. This is a behavior that can be seen within the pious people and piety and fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of the key ingredients in the traits of a true mu'min. The next strategy I want to tell you about is stress management. Stress physically can have a very detrimental effect to the human body but it also has a detrimental and a negative effect to your general state of mind, the, the state of your soul. Because a mind that is constantly worried about something will never be focused, will never be concentrating. And that means that you won't be able to concentrate on your prayers. So, my advice to you to do every day would be to exercise, to relax, to meditate, to reflect, to contemplate, in order to try and let things which are worrying you and chaining you down, let them go. Learn adaptation strategies and think about how you can plan things, change your life in order to make sure that you're not stressed all the time. Avoid other foods that can cause stress such as fats, sugar, caffeine and don't smoke. Take time away from your busy lives from time to time. Take a holiday because when we look at prayers and we see people who pray who are constantly stressed, it is obvious from the look on their face, from the way they behave, their body language, that they can't fully focus not only in prayer, but in other aspects of their life. The next strategy I want to present in front of you is moderation in eating. You see, eating and drinking, even though, even though they're essential, for the human body to sustain the human body. When you eat too much and you live in order to eat and food becomes such a big part of your life that you're constantly always full and unable to be mobile physically and also spiritually you're burdened down with all that food and the, and the, and the full stomach. It is surely detrimental to your body and detrimental to your soul. Imam Ridha alayhi salam says, you should know that a human body is like fertile land. If moderation is exercised in the matter of development, i.e. necessary quantities of water to provide for it, which should neither be so excessive as to drown it, nor be so little as to keep it thirsty, that yields more produce. However, that land will become barren if it's not looked after properly. Therefore, Overeating and, and drinking too much causes lack of concentration during prayer. 
And one needs to take care because this is a problem that we face if we're constantly eating and we have five daily prayers. For every single prayer, we will not be able to focus properly. Luqman has said to his son, Dear son, when your stomach is full, your faculty of thinking goes to sleep. Your tongue of wisdom becomes dumb and your limbs fail to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Strategy 11 that I want to present is assessing, reassessing. Keep track of your attention and concentration in prayer at all times. It is a proactive thing. You must constantly be thinking about your prayer, conditioning your mind so that at all times you're always reassessing what's happening and then you're able to fix it. And if you can't, then ask for forgiveness. Self-conditioning, self-examination, contemplation. Again, the essential prerequisites for a seeker of truth who's battling with his own nafs. Self-conditioning means being binded or binding oneself with the resolution not to do anything against the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reassess, contemplate, try to be in a state of mind at night especially. It's a time for introspection, time for inner deliberation, time for contemplation and reflection. Evaluate your deeds through the day and for the deeds that you've committed which would be displeasurable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask for forgiveness and for those deeds which you've done which have been aided with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give your thanks reviewing your performance on a daily basis surely is only healthy for your mind and healthy for your soul but use prayer time as another time of day where you can think meditate and deliberate because if you do that you will constantly be thinking about your position in this world about the mistakes you've made and as you seek forgiveness, you think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He becomes the focus of your prayer. Finally, last but not least, the strategy that I think is very important is putting your thoughts into writing. Unfortunately, in this world that we live in, we run day to day and it's almost like a rat race. You start your, your, your day in the morning, you go to work, you're busy with work, you come home, you may have families, you may have other commitments and you end up in this rat race where you're constantly fighting with time. You don't get time to think about your mistakes, you don't get time to contemplate about life, you don't get time to set goals. So what I suggest you do is just once during the day, if you can't do it once during the day, do it once a week and if you can't do it once a week, do it once a month. Put your thoughts your reflections, your goals into writing. Because whenever you're stuck or your mind's in a state of discomfort, your soul is aching, you can look back at what you've written and remind yourself of the goals, remind yourself of your intention and your sincerity, remind yourself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your ultimate end goal. Many scholars have advised that you do this also because it allows you to free your mind of the things that chain it down allows you to put things into perspective as you're writing them it allows you to cleanse your soul of anything that burdens it so these are my tips my strategies for how you can concentrate during prayer and inshallah we hope that by thinking about these strategies you can also optimize your prayers as I've said before, during these very highly spiritual nights where the doors of Allah's mercy are open, pray for yourself, pray for those around you, pray for those in the world who don't have as much as you do, those orphans around the world who sometimes don't even have food or water, especially in this month of Ramadan. Please don't forget us in your du'as as well. And finally, do not forget to pray for the reappearance of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam.
Imam Ali, commander of the faithful, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, has said, The month of Ramadan has approached you. It is the chief of all months and the beginning of the year. For this segment of the episode, we're once again going to be going to different parts of the world to see how people across the globe prepare for the month of Ramadan, what they do on their day-to-day -day lives. And my journeys have taken me to many, many places around the world, but this is by far one of the most unique places, one of the places where there's such harsh realities that people have no choice but to be self-sustaining and to adopt their lives in a very unique sort of way. The area that we're visiting today is the Bedouins of Sub-Saharan Africa. For those of you who are not aware, the Sub-Saharan region is one of the harshest climates on this planet. It's one of the hottest weathers, one of the driest weathers on the planet, as well as having very, very subtle but yet profound, um, profound deprivations for their people such as in the desert of Africa, there's very little shade and with the heat, the people there find it extremely difficult to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. So they have to make do and, and, and adopt their lifestyles and really try and find ways to get past this month and to make the most of this month, in fact. So the normal day for a Bedouin in Sub-Saharan Africa starts off with baking bread. The Bedouins don't eat rice they tend to eat more bread throughout the day. The reason why they bake their bread fresh, bright and early in the day is that the children who wake up very early in the morning, they tend to have the bread for breakfast and then again when they come back in the afternoon from school. The men of the family wake up very early in the morning because they have no choice as they are usually camel herders or, cattle, or, or, they, or they farm cattle and for them their animals are their livelihood, so they have to look after them. And they get up early in the morning, they go to work, they look after their camel and their cattle, and they try and make a living through that. The women sit, or they are at home, and they carry out the day-to-day -day chores of a housewife. And when the children come back from school, at Dhuhr time, they usually have a small meal, if they're not fasting, and then they go, back, they go to bed for long enough just to wake up a couple of hours before iftar. Close to iftar time, the men of the family come home. And during iftar time, the first thing they do is that they have dates, as is the sunnah of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. The dates come from palm trees which actually grow in that region. And they also make a soup with whatever is available to them at the time. So it could be things like lentils, vegetables, and they also milk their own animals, milk their own camels, milk their own cattle in order to provide milk for the family. And the milk actually is one of the best uh, rehydrators that we know and it's natural as well. Following this, usually the family get together and they have uh, some food. Usually it's bread and meat, the bread that they made earlier on in the day. And the meat is actually from the animals that they are, are rearing, their livestock. Because the Bedouins are a self-sustaining tribe, because they live in the harshest of climates, and the harshest of areas in this world, they have no other option but to be self-sustaining. As I've requested before in the previous episodes, we would be honored and would be very grateful if you could send in your videos from wherever you are in the world, your pictures, your blogs, your anecdotes, so that we can have an insight into your life how do you prepare your day-to-day -day life for the month of Ramadan? How do you prepare your food? How do you prepare, um, how do you prepare yourself for the nights of Qadr? How do you go about your day-to-day -day activities such as work and school? Inshallah, we look forward to seeing your videos and inshallah airing them exclusively on Imam Hussein TV. بسم الله 
الله الرحمن الرحيم respected viewers السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته may peace and blessing and protection of Allah be upon each and every one of you in continuation to our reports from the holy city of Karbala and the restaurant of Rukn al-Sultan today we are here to show you the other parts of the restaurant so stay tuned سيدنا ممكن تتفضل لنا عن المقبلات المقبلات ابو بكر السلطان جزء مهم هي من جزء مهم واساسي من المطعم المقبلات عندنا يسوي يسووها ويقومون بها ايادي سوريه وشيف سوري ومساعدي كذلك وشوفوا الحمد لله عليها اقبال وفي شيء خاص ابو بكر السلطان وات از سو يونيك اباوت ركن السلطان از ذا ابيتايزرز ذات ذي سيرف هير ذا ابيتايزرز ار ميد with uh, a Syrian chief and his assistant. And as you can see, the visitors to, the, to this uh, specific restaurant love the taste of these appetizers. نعم سيدنا تتفضل لنا عن القسم الايراني والاكلات الايرانيه بالنسبه مثل ما قاعد تشوفون اكو تمن ومايك واكو شله خاصه سوب وعندنا كبب ايراني هسه اذا بعدين نشوفها بالتصوير تطلع بالكاميرا بالنسبه للقسم الايراني يكون واضح هنا على البوفيه لانه هو مطبخ مو مثل قسم مشوي وخارجي وتقدر تصوره هو طبخ خاص يعني فينعرض فان شاء الله تصوروا وشوفوا بالعرض I asked about the Iranian section and he's saying that the Iranian chief provides the variety of uh, foods here which are all originated uh, from Iran and this section is a very special and unique section in Rakhna Sultan restaurant. Following our previous episodes on medical hints and health advice, we talked about headaches and thereafter I talked a little bit, little bit about the benefits of tears and crying, linking this to what our Aimma alayhi salam have said about crying and remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remembering the Messiah of members of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Now, today what I want to do is follow on from the concept of tears and talk to you a little bit about eye problems. Many people from around the world suffer from many ailments of the eyes, from simple things like refract refractory problems, which basically mean being short-sighted or long-sighted, and therefore you need prescriptive lenses to aid those refractory errors. Or whether it's something more serious such as cataracts, or glaucoma, or even things like Di problems re related to diabetes, so diabetic retinopathy or hypertensive retinopathy. 
inshallah during this episode I'll just briefly cover a few possible ailments of the eyes something that you can keep an eye out for mind the pun during the course of this month and also during your day-to-day -day life the eyes obviously are said within many many books in history the eyes are the window to the heart and the window to the soul so inshallah I hope that by giving you this advice you can keep the vision of your eyes and, and keep the beauty of what you see, keep your sight. The first condition I want to talk about is one of the most commonest conditions that people with eye problems suffer from and that's conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis is basically inflammation of the conjunctiva which can be caused by infection usually, either viral or bacterial and the conjunctiva sits at the bottom of the eyes here but people who suffer from conjunctivitis usually get reddening of the eye, this feeling that there is some grit in the eye and they feel very itchy. People who get these symptoms usually when they go and see a doctor get antibiotic uh, drops and usually these drops tend to be useful. However, be very very careful because simple conjunctivitis can deteriorate and get worse so if it's not working or the drops aren't working, go and see your doctor. Other things to look out for in people with eye problems are very very uh, very very uh, uh, important symptoms things like losing vision in the eye things like pain behind the eye itself obviously conjunctivitis is irritation of the eye which is different to pain in the eye as I've said before conjunctivitis can be caused by inflammation inflammation can also be caused by allergies some people who have pollen allergies and have hay fever often find that they get allergic conjunctivitis. Once again, if you go and see your doctor, they can prescribe you antihistamines or drops which will help to get rid of the conjunctivitis. Another condition which affects the eyes and is very common, especially amongst the elderly, although many younger people can get it, is something called cataracts. Cataracts is a condition where there's a protein layer that develops on the lens of the eye and if you're finding that your vision is getting hazy and you're finding it difficult to see, it's very important that you see a doctor or an eye specialist. The reason being that when they look into your eyes, they're trying to look at the back of the retina. When I see my patients and I look into their eyes and I can't see the back of the retina, I know that there's something blocking that vision and sometimes it can be a cataract which is actually sitting on the lens, which sits in between the retina and the pupil which is outside the, the, uh, outside the lens. Now, for people who have cataracts, unfortunately the only treatment is surgical intervention. But for those people it's very important that you see a doctor quickly before your condition deteriorates. Before talking too much about eye problems, obviously it's, it's, it's a topic that covers such a wide, a wide spectrum and such a vast area that it's very difficult to talk about everything that I want to talk about in this episode. However, I'll talk a little bit about Retinopathy. Retinopathy is simply uh, a problem or a pathology or an issue with the retina itself. We see so many different types of retinopathies. But the commonest ones are what we call diabetic retinopathy and hypertensive ret retinopathy. This is basically where the blood vessels in the eyes get so much affected by uncontrolled diabetes or high blood pressure that they burst and then new vessels form. But as these vessels form, they don't form in the correct way. They get overproduced and you get retinopathy because the blood vessels create a, a pressure force which causes retinal detachment eventually. So it's very important for those of you who suffer from diabetes and those of you who suffer from high blood pressure to keep that under, under control because one of the side effects or the complications of not doing that will be eventually the loss of your vision. Finally, without t taking too much of your time. I just want to tell you about some red flag symptoms that you need to keep an eye out for. To make sure that if you are suffering from long-term problems or even acute problems that you get seen by a doctor as soon as possible. The first thing is any loss of vision, I suggest you go and see a doctor. Whether you think that your vision has deteriorated all of a sudden or whether it's complete loss of vision, please go and see a doctor as soon as possible. The second thing is when you get pain in the eye, by that I don't mean itchiness in the eye but actual physical pain within the eye itself or at the back of the eye. It can be a sign of conditions such as glaucoma 
pain behind the eye can be a sign of optic neuritis which can be a symptom of multiple sclerosis so make sure that you have uh, you keep an eye out for these uh, symptoms I would like to ask you to continue to keep in, uh, keep in your mind these symptoms that I've mentioned because eventually what happens over a prolonged period of time that people neglect their eyes they stop wearing their lenses, stop wearing their prescription glasses they don't see the world for what it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with these eyes and has blessed you with this world around you the reason being that He wants you to enjoy His bounties He wants you to enjoy the world that He's created for you so do that appreciate His might, appreciate His mercy appreciate His bounties Inshallah when you do that it will not only allow you to improve your physical health the health of your eyes but also it will allow you to ascend spiritually as well During the time Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, when he was Khalifa, a man and a Christian in religion worked all of his life but could not save anything for his old age. Lately he had become blind and, and as a result he became a beggar in the streets of Kufa. He used to stand on a corner of the lane and beg. One day Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, the leader of the faithful, was passing by and saw this beggar in his condition. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, out of his curious uh, out of his curiosity, he asked about the condition of this man. They replied to him by saying that Ya Ali Nabi Talib, this man was a Christian. When he was young, he worked hard, but now he's old, he cannot work. And since he's blind, he became a beggar. Imam Ali Nabi Talib said, strange, till he was strong, you took his work and you took his money. But now that he is blind, you left him without anything. This, this story shows that Whenever a person works hard, when he, when he turns old, people should in return support him. Therefore, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib said, it is the duty of the government and the society to support him until he is alive. Go, he told his companions, go and give him a life pension of the state's treasury. As we're approaching the nights of power, the nights of Al-Qadr, we pray for many things. They say that the doors of Allah's mercy are open on these nights. These are the nights that are considered to be more superior than any other night in the calendar. We pray for many things. We pray for our own worldly desires. We pray for our own spiritual refinement. But there's one supplication that should be the highest above all, and that is to pray for the reappearance of the 12th Imam alayhi salam. I want to present a poem in front of you called Waiting For You. It's a, it's a small poem that me and my brother Abbas have written. Our lives are our dark lives are and dark our hearts are broken. Hearts are broken. Now is the now time is the for time your intervention. intervention. There are no there choices are no choice left. left, there is no, there is option. no option, there is no there hope is no left. left. You are the, you chosen. Are the chosen, our souls, our are, souls dying. are dying, whilst we, whilst are, still we are still alive. alive. How can we How go can we on? on? How can How we can now we survive? survive? We're waiting We're for waiting that for time when you time will arrive so that religion and faith can be revived the world's become false please come and make it true oh mahdi we're waiting for you oh mahdi we're waiting for you 
oh Mehdi, been waiting for you. The poor are dying, the tears are flowing, they have lost everything. Their fears are growing, the world is standing by, though it is no way. The persecution that they are facing, wherever we look, there is just bloodshed. There is no love left, not even a shred. Now all around the world, the evil has spread. Though hearts are beating, inside they are dead. There's no sincerity in the good are but a few. Oh, Mahdi, we're waiting for you. Oh, Mahdi, we're waiting for you. Oh, Mahdi, we're waiting for you. The times before falling. The lovers of her say, the unprecedented. We're facing so much pain, so many massacres from place to place. The streets of Pakistan, the roads of Bahrain. The world is crying out for you to bring peace. Avenge these genocides through your justice and rid this universe of evil and sin. Allow us to be the ones within your midst. The world has lost love, is hurtful and cruel. Oh, Mahdi, we're waiting for you. Oh, Mehdi, we're waiting for you. Oh, Mehdi, we're waiting for you. Imam Ali, commander of the faithful, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, has said, The month of Ramadan has approached you. It is the chief of all months and the beginning of the year. As we conclude another episode of the Ramadan show, I would like to leave you with a final thought, something to get you to contemplate and to think about over these next few nights. This thought is actually quite complex and even with me, it's actually something I think about quite regularly. And that final thought is, the relationship between the Ahlul Bayt and Allah is so complex, it's the ultimate paradigm, it's the complete beginning and end of love. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Hadith Al-Qisa says, to the Ahlul Bayt, he says, I've made this whole universe, the mountains, the skies, the rivers, the earth, in your love. But the amazing thing is that the Ahlul Bayt, they gave everything that they have back in the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we take their example, even when we have everything, whether it's materialistic, whether it's specific traits, remember that all of it's come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything that we have should be sacrificed back for him. I would like to once again remind you to please send in your videos and to also join us on social media, on Instagram, on Twitter, where you can use the hashtag IHTVRamadan, on Facebook and on YouTube. Until next time, I hope that we can once again inspire you and be your one-stop shop for the month of Ramadan. 
I bid you farewell. Wassalamu alaikum. Jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.